Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Gordon Ritchie and Karen Mills and I are not only the privileged choir directors of our our choir, Coriolis, but we're also your service leaders this morning. And we do hope that you feel welcome here today. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, multi-generational religious community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free-thinking, spiritual questing individuals joined in common support and action. We welcome diversity, including diversity of beliefs from divine believers to humanists, from pagans to atheists and agnostics. We believe in the compassion of the human heart, the warmth of community, the pursuit of justice, and the search for truth and meaning in our lives. We gather with gratitude this morning on traditional Cree lands that are now part of Treaty 6, shared by many nations. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all our children. We have a fabulous service for you this morning, if I must say. (laughs) And if by chance you're not feeling fabulous at the moment, I trust that by the end of this service, you will all be feeling quite Fabulous. We'll begin our service with a prelude. Take time in life, take time in life, brother, take time in life, take time in life, my brother, take time in life, take time in life, brother, take time in life, take time in life. I would like to invite Lauren forward for our opening words. We gather here as individual people, young and old, all genders, able and disabled, LGBTQ+, and their allies, all colors of the human race, theist, atheist, agnostic, Christian, Buddhist, feminist, humanist, and pagan. We gather here as a community of people who are more than categories. We gather here, each ministering to the other, meeting one another's strengths, encouraging wholeness. We give thanks for this extraordinary blessing, the gathering together of separate, unique individuals as one whole, one body, our church. Here may our minds stretch, our hearts open, our spirits deepen. 
Here may we acknowledge our brokenness and be ever stirred by love's infinite possibilities. Come, let us worship. Thank you, Lauren. We've got a bit of a color theme going on for this morning. So it seems fitting that our first hymn this morning is De Colores, hymn number 305. I invite you to stand as you are willing and able. As we sing this, our children and youth will come forward and light our rainbow candles. Let's sing together hymn number 305. Our next reading is by Naomi King. Now, some of you have hearts with you, so be prepared. Your moment is coming. We are a rainbow people. A rainbow is an arc of light brilliantly displaying all the colors of the visual spectrum, all the colors that combine to make an astonishingly beautiful world, all the colors that combine to reflect a beautiful diversity of human expression. We are red people. Where's my red people? Thank you. Hold them high. We are red people who respect one another. We are orange people who offer faith and kind treatment. We are yellow people. There we go. We are yellow people yearning for learning. We are green people who grow in our search for truth and meaning. We are blue people who believe in what we are achieving. We are purple people insisting on freedom, love, and peace. And finally, we are violet people valuing the web that does not cease and we did not create. Now keep holding your your hearts up high, rainbow people, because we are rainbow people. Together, uh, what we give heals and transforms our world. This is our covenant, our bridge of heaven, our dream and our reality. The flame of the chalice lit around our world is the source of light and the pot of gold at the end of our rainbow. The flame of the chalice is filled with the light we bring and nurtured by our hopes and dreams. Remember, rainbows begin with you and me. Thank you, rainbow people. And now I would like to invite one of our fabulous couples up to light our chalice this morning. Will and David, please, light our chalice. (laughs) 
These words are by Linda Lee Franson. We light this chalice to ignite our hearts and minds. The spark of knowledge that enlightens, the shimmering hope that burns, the blazing hope that engulfs our actions, the bonfire of our commitment. We light this flame for those who celebrate themselves, who fear, who hope, who persevere, who stand on the side of love for all. We light this flame for those who have been ridiculed, that they may find peace. For those who fight to marry, that they may celebrate. For those who live in uncertainty in the world, that they may have hope. We light this flame to renew our commitment that no one shall ever suffer again for the right to love. We light this flame to celebrate our kaleidoscope of diversity, working, loving, and living on the side of love. For this, we light our flame. Thank you. Each week we take an offering to support not only the work of our church, but the larger community. And in doing so, knowing that it is Canvas Month, I would like to invite Ruth forward for a WeChat. Just for the record, I'm one of the many, well, three Ruths currently in the church, so I'm Ruth Marriott. Um, I'm here on behalf of Andrew Mills, who is the Canvas Chair. Now, I know, disregarding this perhaps overly formal wear that I'm wearing, I look like a nice person. And then I get up in church and talk about money. So I'll tell you why I'm up here to talk about money and why I'm involved with the, the canvas this year and also why it's personally important to me to pledge to the church each year. Now, like most people in Edmonton, if I don't regularly pay attention to my bank account, then I may not have a safe place to go home to, and I may not have the resources to do the things that are important to me. And that's the same thing for this church. Without pledges, without the financial resources, we won't have this safe place to come and to pursue our free and responsible search for finding our truths. And we won't have, the church also won't have the resources for doing the things that are important to us as a church community. So I was asked to talk a little bit on how you can pledge and how you can contribute. Well, the first way that you'll see in a few minutes, of course, is money that goes into the offering. So it might be cash, and you can fulfill your pledge through cash. But just to be realistic about it, the money that goes into the collection plate is more of a spontaneous thing. A lot of people like it to just sort of share their gratitude and connect with the community. I looked at the numbers, and the amount that goes in in loose cash into the plate would, in the whole year, would pay for approximately 11 days of staffing in this church, only 11 days. So clearly, it's... A small part, but it's not the majority of the the part. Some people pay by checks. They might pay one check a a year. They might pay several. And uh, if that works for them, that's good. It does take a little bit of effort on there. Some people go to the online donations. And we currently have two, Canada Helps and ATB Cares, Now, I've used one of them myself for other charities that I donate to, and there's a few details. You can see me after the church service or look at Andrew's materials online if you want more details about how they work. A lot of times uh, that works well for people that have a strong preference to pay by a, a credit card. And the third option is the pre authorized withdrawals. And those are probably the easiest for you and for the church. Uh, Some people might have some questions like, well, you know, I pledge. What happens if partway through the year I have to decrease the amount? No problem. (laughs) Seen it happen, it can be changed there. What if I have to discontinue? Likewise. What if I find my circumstances are changed and I want to increase? Or my bank account changes? 
Again, it's a case of contacting me, Andrew, or a simple call to the church office, and we'll see what happens for the, for the next run. So in thinking about preauthorized withdrawals, I'm actually reminded of a joke that our minister told, not Brian, it was a previous minister, and it was actually before the era of preauthorized withdrawals, but it is, I think, relevant. Now, John Marsh was the minister back in the late 80s and uh, first half of the 1990s, and he had a tradition of telling a joke before the offering was, was taken. And this joke obviously stayed with me. It's a story about a Unitarian who in the summertime goes up to the mountains on a hike. And the Unitarian is merely hiking along through the woods and enjoying, enjoying the scenery and all the rest of it. And then there's a snuffling in the woods and then looks around. My goodness, there's a bear, and the bear's coming for him. So he looks around, no trees to climb, things, ah, but there's a hollow log. So quick as he can, in fear of his life, he's scurrying around and crawls inside the log. Well, the bear snuff, probably hungry, snuffles around the log, snuffles at one end, snuffles at the other, paws a bit, cannot get to the Unitarian. <sighs> That's a good one. So apparently the bear goes away. The Unitarian can't see what's happening out there, but listens very carefully. In the meantime, thinks of all the things that he would miss in his life, including the church, including his family. Church, oh, wait a minute. He forgot to give his donations during the summertime. And that thought makes him feel so small that he has no trouble in wriggling out of the log and getting on with his hike. So pre-authorized withdrawals, <laughs> you don't have to worry about them. You're, the church has your support. I'll be around after the service if you want to tell me any other church jokes or if you want have any questions about the pledge form, which you'll find with your order of service. Thank you, Ruth. Well, the only jokes that I know are, come from my mother, and they're not appropriate for Sunday morning, so... Love you, Mom. I should mention that half of the unidentified cash received this morning is shared with the International Council of Unitarian Universalists. If you'd like some more information on that, I would encourage you to check out the display board in our uh, lobby. You'll find some more information about this wonderful organization. Let's join together in our offering response. Was the offering done? Oh, yeah. Let's sing. Bring it on down. So I came across this reading, and I thought, okay, here's a service, and now here's Karen. (laughs) Pay you later. Do you suffer from the fear of being fabulous? Think about all the play small messages many children receive on a daily basis. Listen to your father and behave properly. Who do you think you are? Be modest. Don't get a swelled head. Remember where you came from. Respect your mother, no matter what she tells you. You think you're too good for us? You need to be humble, and don't you forget it. People like us don't go to places like that. Every day, that list of holdbacks and thousands of similar play small messages get expressed or played out silently over and over and over And those messages land smack dab into an unconscious mind of the child where they will stay alive, albeit quietly, haunting every day of that child's future. And every one of us has been subjected to some form of commandment to not break out beyond where you came from, to not really leave home. So you end up feeling blocked by what I call the fear of being fabulous. 
Whether it came from a demanding and controlling parent, a terrified and anxious teacher, an abusive coach, or any number of relatives, romantic partners, or so-called friends who didn't know any better, the damage happened anyway. And what's the damage? A smaller life than you know could be yours. Perhaps you feel limited in what you can do in your career, where or whether you can go to college or get specialized professional training, even who you can date, love, or marry. The damage may have spread to your bank account, your health and fitness, and even how you dress and carry yourself in the world. But here's the good news. No matter your age, no matter where you're at, it's never too late to burst out of that internal prison that's been holding you back. And the fact is, now your life is yours to design. It is. As long as you are willing to investigate and confront what's living in your unconscious, you are truly free to design any life you want. There's an idea that may feel like a betrayal of where you came from and what you've believed was true your whole life. But why live in bondage to how others insisted you should be? It doesn't matter whether it was what they told you or it could have been how they treated you or how they behaved that made you feel and act in certain ways that limited what you could be. Now I want to provide you a few tips to help support you in your willingness, your commitment to be free to be fabulous. Firstly, recognize that you are a unique, one-of-a-kind person. There has never been and there never will be another you. Therefore, it doesn't matter what anyone has accomplished, what anyone else owns, does, or is, nor does it matter what you've not done before now. All that matters is what you need to accomplish and experience so you can enjoy the specific, successful life that is yours. Maybe sometime later, take a moment to jot down three, time, three things that you must make real to actually claim the life that you truly want. Strengthen your desire. Strengthen your commitment to make them happen. There's action, that action. It's the kind of internalized action necessary to take the external steps required to get you where you want to be. Secondly, notice if anyone in your current life seems determined to keep you back, whether it's a relative or a friend. If someone or several someones cannot cheer you on, cannot support your dream, then you must become aware that those relationships might not be in your best interest. In fact, they're toxic to you and your well-being. And they're truly toxic because they imprison and undermine your deepest expressive self. As difficult as it may seem right now, you need to distance yourself from those holding you back, the relationships that don't leave room for a new you a more expanded and a more alive you. That doesn't mean you need to cut people off unnecessarily, but it does mean you have to monitor the hold yourself back folks and exit the scene whenever they try to stand in the way of who you truly are meant to be. And finally, for now, commit to taking one step tomorrow, just one step in whatever you can that will move you a little bit closer to your best successful life doesn't matter what it is, only that it leads you in the right direction. Promise to you and your larger future that you will take steps which will begin moving you through to that other side of what's been holding you back, and then do it. When you do, you'll be on your way to overcoming the fear of being fabulous. Please join in hymn number 100. Uh, I've got peace like a river. And it's going to be an up-tempo kind of rock inversion.
like to invite Marilyn up for our next reading. Any other questions by Victoria E. Stafford? Stafford. People ask me sometimes, is this a gay church? It is the privilege to answer. Ours is absolutely, gladly, hopefully, and humbly, gaily, a gay church, a gay tradition where everyone, including heterosexual members, and friends, is welcome where everyone is needed, where everyone's experience is cherished as a sacred text, because no one's experience of living or loving can be comprehensive, because each of us holds clues the others need about how to live with dignity and joy as a human person, and none of us knows enough about that yet to be considered whole. It's absolutely a gay church, even as ours is a gay world. If you would look around, gay church, straight church, people's church, a human congregation, made holy by the holy hopes and fears and dreams of all who wish to come. Come in, we say. Come out. Come in. We're all in this together. I will not speak of tolerance with its courteous clenched teeth and bitter resignation. I will not speak about acceptance of other people and some other kind of lifestyle. I can only look in laughing wonder at human life in all its incarnations. I can taste only in passing the breath of the spirit of life on my mouth and understand our common longing to breathe in deep, deep gulps of it. I cannot think of being anybody else's ally, even, because even that implies some degree of separation, some degree of safety for some of us, not all. We are allied with no one and with nothing but love. The larger love transcending all our understanding, within which all the different, differing, gorgeously various, variant, beautifully deviant aspects of ourselves are bound in elegant unity. I know that on some sad and disappointing days, these words describe the church that yet shall be, and not the church that is. I know, I know. But I know, too, that to answer is an act of creation. To answer this question and some others is a privilege, a prophetic imperative, a joy, a duty, and a holy sacrament. Please join with me in our responsive reading. Number 576, words by Marjorie Bowen Wheatley. I'll read the regular font and ask you to read the italicized. A Liturgy of Restoration. If recognizing the interdependence of all life, we strive to build community, the strength we gather will be our salvation. If you are black and I am white, if you are female and I am male, if you are older and I am younger, if you are progressive and I am conservative, if you are straight and I am gay, if you are Christian and I am Jewish, if we join spirits as brothers and sisters, the pain of our aloneness will be lessened, and that does matter. Amen. These are the words of Isabel Rose. 
Four years ago, on a summer afternoon in late July, I was making cucumber soup in my kitchen when a wisp of light blue flashed across my yard. I dropped my peeler and saw through the window our four-year-old son wandering around the garden dressed like Cinderella. I recognized the dress immediately. It had been his older sister's, cast away, no doubt, in a donation bag that we just hadn't quite got around to donating. I didn't race outside, tear the dress off, and proffer admonishments. I watched, instead, as his makeshift wand of willow danced through the air, a little princess going from flower bed to flower bed, casting enchantments upon the marigolds. I let our child continue playing undisturbed, but before I returned to my soup, I did what we all do when we see something adorable. I grabbed my phone and snapped a photo. Later that night, my husband and I went out to dinner with another couple we didn't know all that well, and as a fellow mum will do, the wife asked to see photos of our children, so I took up my phone and began swiping through to the recent family shots. <gasps> Aren't their children adorable, she exclaimed, grabbed the phone out of my hands and started showing the photos to her husband. Before I could get the phone back, they discovered the photos from that afternoon. I saw them exchanged, puzzled looks, and then the wife said, this is your son? Sensing their disapproval, I smiled and responded as calmly as I could, yes, he likes to play princess sometimes. You really shouldn't encourage that behavior, the wife said with grave compassion, usually reserved for the potential of a terminal illness. When our son was little, he liked to play dress up too, but we didn't indulge it, not one bit. I even hired a male nanny, and now our son is completely normal. A strapping teenage boy, very popular with the girls, nothing odd about him at all. You can't indulge it, the husband concurred. That's the key. It's no different than enforcing bedtime. Children are malleable. You can shape them, but not indulge their every whim. I politely thanked them for their unsolicited advice, and my husband deftly changed the topic. But as I lay in bed that night, I couldn't stop thinking about the word indulgent. Was it really indulgence to allow our child the freedom to express himself? It's not as if he was shooting a BB gun at the neighbor's cat or throwing sand in another kid's face. And since that incident, I've had the word indulgent leveled at me many times by various detractors who disagree with the unconditional love and support that my husband and I have offered our now eight-year-old transgender daughter. As if the choice was the same as offering her an extra slice of cake when I knew she'd already had seconds. And here's what I would say to those people. When it comes to parenting, indulgence and permission are two different things. When we indulge a child, we let them get away with something, usually a behavior, considered reprehensible by others. When we offer a child permission, we give them the reassurance that what they are doing is okay. I like to think that the permission we gave Samuel to play as he saw fit in his early years paved the path for later emotional maturity and security. On the eve of his sixth birthday, after a four-year battle with self-hatred and depression, he felt safe enough to transition from living as a little boy to living as a little girl. It was like witnessing a second birth. And now we have a daughter who greets each day with excitement. Her name is Sadie, and she's just as precious to us as her male counterpart was, only much, much happier. Please join in hymn number 323, Break Not the Circle.
A reading by Lois Van Leer. They will march, walk, wheel, dance, shimmy and shake, block upon block of undulating color, flesh, banners, signs, clothing, or lack thereof, hands raised, hands linked, apart, together, singing, shouting, chanting, silent, joyous, tearful, nervous, afraid, proud, defiant, angry, happy, delirious, tentative, ecstatic, courageous, brave, free. The stereotype, the unrecognizable, the flamboyant, the ordinary, the parent, the child, the runaway, the lost, the lonely, the found, gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, queer, intersexed, questioning, allies. Those who taught and jeer, their banners of hate ten feet tall. God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, burn in hell. The other slogans, straight but not narrow, I love my gay child, standing on the side of love. One day a year, one out of 365, Mardi Gras out of season, festive, bacchanalian, tame, booze, food, shopping. Underneath, there is a history, resistance. It was the marginalized of the marginalized. Dry queens, transvestites, the butch and the femme, who, unlike Rosa Parks, did not sit down, but in their tired rage stood up, rose up, fought back, holding the police captive in the bars they had come to raid. Their weapons their oppression, their hands, beer bottles, stonewall. Six days of riots in New York, June 1969. A year later, a march in Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, L.A., San Fran, and now any weekend in June, anywhere around the world, pride. Why do we march? For those who are not able, for those who have been murdered, for those who are ravaged by disease, for those who are still beaten, still taunted, still harassed, still victims, still targets. Why do we march? Because some truths ain't self evidence because all men ain't protected equal, and we love a good party. (laughs) They will march, walk, wheel, dance, shimmy and shake, block upon block of undulating color, flesh, banners, signs, clothing, or lack thereof, hands raised, hands linked apart, together, singing, Shouting, chanting, silent, joyous, tearful, nervous, afraid, proud, defiant, angry, happy, delirious, tentative, ecstatic, courageous, brave, free. Let us celebrate our community. Let us acknowledge the joys and concerns, the celebrations, the challenges in our own lives, but those in our world. For those who would like to come forward and light a silent candle, please do so now. May we carry the joys, concerns, the moments represented in these tiny lights in our hearts. They express very deeply that we are not alone. 
As we prepare for a time of quiet meditation and reflection, I invite you to remain seated as we sing our next hymn, number 95, There Is More Love, hymn number 95. I invite you to join me in a time of prayer, meditation, and reflection, to be fully present here and now in this sacred time and space with ourselves, with each other, and with that which is larger than ourselves. This is a reading called Part of Life by John Saxon. Source of all, all life, all love, all hope, known by many names and in many ways. We don't know who or what you are, or even whether you can be called a who or what. Our words fail us. Our minds fail us when we ponder the enormity, diversity, complexity, wonder, and beauty of the universe and this world. And yet we sense more than know that our loves are part of a larger life, that we are indeed connected with everyone and everything in one interdependent web of being and that there is something both imminent and transcendent that nurtures and sustains our lives and life itself, something that calls us and all life to greater wholeness and harmony. We give thanks this morning for all the gifts and blessings of life, for this day, for the beauty and wonder and mystery of life, for our families and friends, for health and work, for opportunities to learn and love and grow, for the love and support of others in times of illness or despair. But we remember, too, that others here in this room, in this city, and around the world live in poverty, hunger, fear, illness, isolation, violence, and economic insecurity. In the silence of this room and in the silence of our hearts, May we hear the call to a wider perspective and a deeper resolve. May we live with greater compassion and care for ourselves, others, and creation. May we touch each other more deeply, hear each other more clearly, and see each other's joys and sorrows as our own. May we strive to be and become more than we are, more loving, more forgiving, more kind, more honest, more open, more connected, more whole. May we heal and be healed. May we face the uncertainties and tragedies of life with hope, faith, and courage, knowing that life is good and that we are not alone.
Closing words are by someone you may have heard of before. Uh, this fellow named Brian Kiley. Spirit of life, if you have a lesson for us, it is that all life is beautiful. We are each born into this world who we are, tall or short, with our own color of skin, with our own sexual orientation. How can anyone ever tell us we are anything less than beautiful, anything less than whole? We pray that this nation and every nation will remember their duty to protect human life and particularly the lives of LGBTQ persons fleeing danger and death. We pray for those who are forced from their homelands and their cultures and their religions, not because of some fault or sin, but because of who they are. Who are placed in grave danger simply for being the person they were born to be. All human beings are born free, equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscious. So may we all act toward one another in affirmation of our common humanity. Please join in singing our final hymn, number 170, We Are a Gentle, Angry People. Our closing words. We have a calling in this world. We are called to honor diversity, to respect differences with dignity, and to challenge those who would forbid it. We are people of a wide path. Let us be wide in affection and go our way in peace. Amen and blessed be.